Hello everybody, welcome back to Mega Projects. Another Mega Projects video about a mega ship. Let's just jump into it. It's the SS Great Eastern. Long before the Titanic, another Leviathan emerged from a British shipyard. The name SS Great Eastern might not be as widely known as the doomed monster that sailed across the Atlantic in 1912, but it really should be. When it appeared out of the Millwall Ironworks on the River Thames in London in 1859, it was, by a considerable distance, the largest ship in the world, a title it would retain for four decades. But it wasn't just its size that made it stand out. This was a ship of firsts, a true pioneer, and one that laid the foundations for the modern steamships that would come. But was it too ahead of its time? As astonishing as this ship was, its ocean life was far from smooth sailing. The Great Eastern will be forever associated with one man. A man who, in a 2002 poll to find the 100 greatest Britons, came in second to Winston Churchill. He was one of the most important figures of the entire industrial age, and his name was Isambard Kingdom Brunel. If you're scratching your head wondering why you've never come across the name of the second most important Briton who has ever lived, you're probably not alone. While his work was utterly groundbreaking and changed many aspects of Britain, his death over 150 years ago has led to his name dimming somewhat. This was a man who designed the first ever tunnel into the River Thames and countless bridges across Britain, of which the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol is perhaps the most iconic. But he is probably best remembered for his work on the Great Western Train Line, which ran from West London to Bristol and eventually on to Exeter. Brunel's original plan was for the passengers to be able to purchase a ticket at London Paddington that would transport them all the way to New York, first by rail and then by ship. While the transatlantic section never completely got off the ground, the railway that was built was a true marvel and included beautiful aqueducts along the way, brand new purpose-built stations, and the world's longest tunnel at the time, known as the Box Tunnel, which ran for 2.95 kilometers. His atmospheric railway, the crude early form of railway using air pressure, proved to be unsuccessful and was one of many instances where Brunel was operating quite simply in a different age to those around him. His exploits made him hugely famous and ignited an innovative spark in Britain at the time. And that's why he's Britain's second greatest. When the Great Western Steamship Company was formed in 1836 to fulfill Brunel's London New York plan, steam power was becoming more common, but at that time many doubted a ship could make it across the Atlantic on just steam alone. The first ship Brunel designed for the company was the Great Western, which made its maiden voyage in 1838, and at 72 meters in length, it was the longest ship in the world at the time. Next came the SS Great Britain, which became the first iron steamer to cross the Atlantic in 1845. The Great Western and Great Britain had both proven to be successful, and before long, Brunel turned his attention to a journey far more ambitious than simply crossing the Atlantic. That would be London to Australia, a trip that took time in the region of four months. On March 25, 1852, Brunel famously made a crude sketch of a steamship in his diary and made the note, say, 600 feet by 65 feet by 30 feet. That's slightly longer than the height of St. Paul's Cathedral, as deep as a cricket pitch, and as wide as two giraffes. At the time, these kinds of measurements for a ship were almost six times bigger than anything else that had been put to sea. After consulting with John Scott Russell, a shipbuilder and naval architect, the two agreed that, in principle, the design would work. It would be a ship of monstrous proportions, but it would float. The two pitched the design to the Great Eastern Company, a newly formed organization that aimed to benefit from the burgeoning trade and emigration routes to and from India, China, and Australia. Their proposal was carefully considered by the board of directors before finally being accepted. The ship that Brunel would come to nickname Great Babe had its green light. By 1854, work was set to begin on the SS Great Eastern. Brunel had estimated the cost to be £500,000, about £55.8 million today, but Russell's tender came out even less at a total of £377,200. £275,200 of that for the hull, £60,000 for the screw engines and boilers, and £42,000 for the paddle engines and boilers. With the finances settled, the first real dilemma the project faced was where to build such an enormous ship. The initial contract had called for it to be constructed in a dock, 
but no such dock currently existed, and the estimated 8,000 to 10,000 pounds, 900,000 to 1.1 million pounds today to build one seemed excessive. Instead, the Great Eastern would be built side on at the Millwall Ironworks on the River Thames, then would be lowered into the water by a mechanical slipway, which Isambard Kingdom Brunel needed to design and build. The monstrous vessel began to take shape on May 1, 1854, when its keel was laid down. The first all iron ship, the Vulcan, had appeared in 1819, but this was a small scale barge used on Scottish canals. The SS Great Britain was the first ocean going ship to be both built of iron and have a screw propeller when it launched in 1843, but the Great Eastern would take things even further. The ship would be the first to come with a double skinned hull, essentially one hull inside the other, a feature that was entirely radical at the time, but has now become compulsory. The inner was 19 mm thick, with the outer slightly larger 0.86 meters. This had support for sections, known as ribs, every 1.8 meters, and the entire hull was divided by two 107 meter long and 18 meter high longitudinal bulkheads. There were also a series of transverse bulkheads that ran across the ship, separating it into 19 compartments. Think of these bulkheads as the skeleton below the double hull, which divided up the ship, but also provided vital support. The Great Eastern came with a variety of forms of propulsion. If they wanted to go old school, the ship came with sails connected to its six masts, supposedly named after the days of the week. Sunday was not included. These all together provided the ship with 1,686 square meters of sails, a size a little bigger than an ice hockey rink. But the Great Eastern was not designed as a traditional sailing ship. Its two other forms of propulsion were the two giant paddle wheels, each measuring 17 meters in diameter, which were powered by four steam engines, and the four-bladed screw propeller, which was 7.3 meters across, powered by an additional steam engine. Altogether, this meant the Great Eastern had around 8,000 horsepower and a maximum speed of 13 knots. To put that in perspective, a modern car will probably only have around 100 to a few hundred horsepower. The project ran into considerable problems in 1856, when it emerged that John Scott Russell was facing significant financial issues. When it became clear that the creditors were beginning to move in, Brunel advised the Great Eastern Company to take control of its ship being built in case it was seized. While this might have been the sensible thing to do, it did speed up Russell's demise. He was found to have liabilities totaling £122,940, about £13.3 million today, and soon after, his creditors began to seize his assets, causing Russell to halt all payments to them. It was agreed that he could complete the contract he was currently working on before his company was liquidated. However, he sent a statement to the Great Eastern Company in which he said he would withdraw from the contract and in doing so would hand the skeletal ship to the company who could do with it as they wished. The company had little choice but to carry on, but this slowed the pace of construction drastically. As 1857 was drawing to a close, with Brunel still not completely satisfied, pressure began to build from the directors of the company. Eventually, he relented and said the ship would launch on the 3rd of November, 1857. Well, that was the plan at least, but I mean, you can't rush greatness. The much publicized launch with some 3,000 paying spectators at the shipyard was shambolic as the steam winches that were supposed to haul the ship down into the water failed miserably. Other attempts were made on the 19th and 28th using hydraulic rams, but once again, they proved inadequate. The largest ship in the world was having problems even getting into the water. But at 1.42 p.m. on the 31st of January, 1858, the Great Eastern inched down into the Thames thanks to a particularly high tide and strong winds. While history remembers the ship as the Great Eastern, it had in fact been christened Leviathan and was changed a year after its launch. She was by far the largest ship ever, measuring 211 meters long, 25 meters wide, and had an unloaded draft of 6.1 meters. The Great Eastern displaced a mighty 32,000 tons of fully loaded. As a comparison, the Great Britain, which had launched 14 years prior, had a displacement of just 3,674 tons. The entire ship was set over four decks and could hold four thousand passengers, but sadly, it wouldn't get anywhere near that, which we'll get into shortly. It also came with a crew complement of 418, but again, because of low passenger numbers, it's likely that it never reached this number either. <laughs> 
Sailors are a bit of a superstitious bunch, and the Great Eastern had a rocky start. Firstly, while cruising down the Thames on its maiden voyage, a huge explosion on board blew one of its funnels into the air. It was found that the feedwater heater's steam exhaust valve had been mistakenly closed, and the power had been exacerbated by the ship's strong bulkheads. The exact number of those who died ranges between 5 and 10, depending on which source you look at. This was about as bad a start as you could imagine. A few months later, another omen manifested itself when the ship's captain, William Harrison, drowned in an incident involving a different boat off the English coast. While the Great Eastern had been designed to be able to reach Australia, it never got anywhere near that distance, because the demand proved to be far below what Great Eastern had forecasted. Instead, it was almost entirely used for transatlantic voyages, but it just failed to capture the imagination. Its first trip to the US in 1860 was delayed 24 hours, and you're really gonna like this, it's because the crew were drunk. When it first arrived in the US, the country was still in the grip of the Civil War, and no fanfare greeted the Great Eastern, as it would larger ships in later decades. The Great Eastern's run of bad luck continued with two further incidents. The first came on the ship's third transatlantic crossing, which began on the 10th of September 1861. Just two days in, and a furious gale began battering the ship. The poor paddle wheel completely disappeared, torn off by a combination of wind and water, while the starboard paddle wheel fared slightly better, but was still badly damaged when one of the lifeboats broke loose and smashed into it. If things couldn't get worse, the crew found that the cast iron rudder post had lost 61 centimeters above its collar. This left the rudder dangling free and constantly smashing into the propeller. The ship had no propulsion and no way to steer. In technical terms, that means they were absolutely screwed. To make matters worse, the captain's efforts to revive the ship had little to no effect, and it wasn't until the crew themselves began to intervene that Hamilton E. Towle, an American civil engineer who was traveling on board, was allowed to try an ingenious plan involving plenty of chain and, no doubt, a great deal of intellect. And it worked. With its limited movement, the Great Eastern limped back to Ireland for major repairs. On the 17th of August 1862, while creeping through Long Island Sound near New York, a lower rumble was heard. The pilots, who had come on board to steer the ship through his native waters, stated that they had probably rubbed up against the northeast rips. The crew member was dispatched below, but reported no flooding, and the ship eventually made it to New York. However, in the cold light of day, things looked rather different. The rocks that the ship had rubbed up against had left a gash 2.7 meters wide and 25 meters long. It would be months until the ship could be repaired, and those rocks have since been renamed Great Eastern Rocks. By this point, the Great Eastern Company was facing huge debts, and the multitude of problems with the ship proved too much. In 1863, the ship hit and sank a smaller sailing ship, killing two people on board. It signaled the end of the Great Eastern as a passenger ship. This great mammoth of a ship hadn't exactly set the world alight, but it would have a positive ending. After the ship was eventually put up for sale, it was bought by a collection of men who desired to turn it into a telegraph cable laying ship, and that was exactly what happened. Slight modifications were made to the ship to fit the giant tanks that would give out the cable, and the Great Eastern played a vital role in the laying of the 1865 transatlantic telegraph cable, putting down roughly 4,200 kilometers worth of cable in the process. And luckily for you, if you're interested in the first transatlantic cable, we already have done a video on mega projects all about that, so please do take a look. Between 1866 and 1878, the ship was responsible for laying over 48,000 kilometers of submarine telegraph cable, most notably from Brest on the Atlantic coast of France to Saint Pierre and Miquelon near Newfoundland in Canada, and from Aden in Yemen to Bombay. Now, of course, Mumbai. After her exploits around the world, there was a brief idea of bringing her back into passenger service, but this idea never went anywhere, and she was eventually scrapped at a shipyard in the River Mersey, a process that took a full 18 months to complete, ending in 1890. What had once been the largest ship in the world was reduced to just scrap metal. If that sounds a little sad, well, there is one nice story to end with. At the time, Everton Football Club, who then played at Anfield Stadium, were on the lookout for a flagpole, and what they found came directly from the Great Eastern. That flagpole still stands today, nearly 130 years later, above Anfield, which, of course, is now home to Everton's hated rivals, Liverpool. And there we have it, a ship so forward-thinking, it became a bit of a white elephant. It faced so many problems that it's difficult to view it as a great success, but historians tend to put a lot of the issues down to the economics at the time, rather than engineering faults. In truth, it was a ship that could never live up to its size 
and expense. Brunel died just before the ship's maiden voyage and never saw the many catastrophes that would befall the ship that he had lovingly nicknamed Great Babe. But he would also never see how its revolutionary designs would be slowly incorporated into modern shipbuilding. The Great Eastern wasn't a success at the time, but had it appeared 30 or 40 years later, things may have been very different. We love a good mega project that doesn't quite work out, not because it isn't worthy, but because it was simply born in the wrong time. The mid to late 19th century was an extraordinary time for innovation, and so much of what we have today stems from ideas that failed at first back then. And in terms of our modern ships, so much of them come from this flawed yet groundbreaking ship. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. If you've got a suggestion for a future mega project, you know what to do. Leave it in the comments below. Upvote the ones you like. And thank you for watching.